last session we finished up our discussion about XNOR net and then we started mobile nets and here we introduced uh, the computational cost of a regular convolution and as you can see these are not cheap these are not cheap operations and that's why we need to look for ways to parallelize stuff for instance one way to parallelize is uh, to run these for loops on k l and n in parallel because these operations are independent from each other and then you can run that in parallel which is going to help you get rid of k which is df by df by n operations because now you are doing them in parallel so you can get rid of this part and that's why gpus are really useful here and also tpus google's internal hardware for deep learning because these operations are not cheap and you have to parallelize them. So that's the message. And most of it is independent. These are simple algebra operations. So it's not hard to parallelize stuff and write the code for it. Even if you start from CUDA, you can simply implement this. It's gonna be more lines of code to what you're used to in Python and TensorFlow and PyTorch, but it's still doable. So that's the computational cost of a convolution and the idea is to reduce the computational cost and one idea is to get rid of this end. With one by one convolutions, we were reducing this end. We had a question last session about why not just use one by one convolutions. You can reduce n, but now we are taking it to the extreme. We want this end to be one and that's where the idea of depth-wise or channel-wise convolutions come in. So you're going to do your convolutions channel-wise per channel it means that you're getting rid of n, but then later on, in the next step, you're gonna mix up the channels. You're gonna do a weighted combination of the channels using a one-by-one -one convolution. And the computational cost of this operation is this. We got rid of n, but then you need to do one-by-one -one convolution after it, but one-by-one -one convolutions are cheap or cheaper than uh, a regular convolution. For instance, if your kernels are three by three, it's nine times cheaper to do a one by one versus three by three. And then we introduce a couple of parameters because we want to have some control over the capacity of our model, depending on the target device. The computational capacity and memory capacity of the target device is gonna help us determine what's the best alpha and row for us. Alpha is just controlling how wide our network are, basically how many channels or how many uh, filter or feature maps we are going to have. And row is the input resolution, which is going to control this part of the computational cost. And here is a visual inspection of what I just explained and the difference between a regular convolution and a depth-wise convolution and a one-by-one -one convolution. So a one-by-one -one convolution is about doing things pixel-wise, doing your operations pixel-wise, a depth-wise convolution is about doing your operations channel-wise. And wherever you have a 3x3 three three convolution, batch norm and ReLU, you're going to replace it by 3x3 three three depth-wise convolution, batch norm, ReLU, and a 1x1 one one convolution after it. That was the microstructure of our network. The macrostructure is what you see on the right. And as you see, after the networking network paper, most of the... Uh, work in computer vision for classification uses average pooling, global average pooling. That is what is enabling us to input images of any resolution during training and testing. But uh, wherever you see DW in this structure is where you have these uh, depth-wise separable convolution. So there is one here, there is another one here, another one here, etc. And what does it save us? when you have mobile net and this one here corresponds to alpha and row being one so it corresponds to this structure these are the accuracy that you get and this is the number of multiplication and additions that you have to do and this is the uh, number of parameters in terms of million and actually the accuracy is comparable to google net and vgg60 with fewer parameters and less multiplication and addition now you can play around with uh, alpha, our width multiplier, to balance the trade-off between what level of accuracy and what level of 
computational and memory wise efficiency you expect from your mobile net. So by varying alpha, yes, you are gonna lose accuracy, but at the same time, you're gaining speed and memory. You're saving memory. So there is this trade-off. Now these are multi-objective optimization, if you think about it. And uh, multi-objective optimization is hard. There is always this trade-off. You need to balance the trade-off between these three, speed, memory, and accuracy. And if you change the resolution parameter, rho, in our case, uh, the number of parameters is not going to change because you still need to change, save the same number of parameters, but the speed is going to vary. The computational cost is going to vary. Any questions before I move to the next topic? I had a, a more general question. Um, yeah. They're coming out with new like tensor processing units and chips with dedicated you know, tensor processing. I'm wondering what that does to to speed up, you know, compared to like a GPU, or is it just a like a GPU, but smaller? No, actually, if you Google uh, tensor cores, actually modern GPUs have tensor processing units. So these are dedicated units for operations on tensors, and the type of operations that you find in convolutions and uh, recurrent neural networks and attention models. So yeah, maybe we can. And maybe this is a good visualization of what's happening behind the scene. Yeah. You can have, I think it was after Turing that they introduced this. And that's the difference between uh, pre-Turing architecture, where things had to be done sort of sequentially, but now you can do the operations in one shot for float 16. And if you have integer eight, uh, this is gonna be a bigger block of, uh, memory that you can process at once. If you do int4, you can process a bigger block, okay? So does this make using something like mobile net almost like obsolete? Uh, not really, not really. And what is the reason for that? Is because not all of the devices are gonna have GPUs on them. So there is a difference between training and inference. It means that you need to find a dedicated uh, processing unit for your target machine. In this mobile net can still benefit from tensor cores for GPUs, even if it's like embedded on something like a like a Jetson or something that has that capability on a smaller scale, right? Yes. So it's a good point. You get like double speed up almost. And they just released a new one, the I think the Jetson Nano, which is super small but super powerful. Yes, these are for your robots and embedded devices. So the idea there, even you have Xavier chips. Uh, that's for self-driving cars, okay? But there are also other companies that have that. These are not for training. You can actually do training on them also, but these are these are small uh, GPUs for mostly inference, okay? Any other questions? While we're on a, on a hardware kick, is there, there are all these extra, yeah, I mean extra, but um, different standards for uh, number representations. So there's FP16, but then there's... You can read this blog post. It's a very good one. You can do automatic mixed precision. So you store your uh, weights in FP32, and you do your operations on FP16. That's a different paradigm. And these are usually automatically done in PyTorch and TensorFlow and MXNet, etc. Does it answer your question? Well, I guess my question is how something like this might decide when to use what. As I said, uh, you're going to save your variables in float 32, and then you're going to do your operations on float 16. It turns out these neural networks are not that sensitive to the exact value of the parameters. About the loss, you need to save that last component of your operations, on, of your computational graph, in float 32 and do the operation on 32. 32 also. And then you have to normalize your loss for it not to take crazy values. You also have to be careful about your gradients. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? These are great questions. These are, yes. So there is a huge competition in terms of hardware for deep learning. And there is this, it's ML curve that these companies uh, compete on these tasks in vision, in language, and recommendations, systems, and uh, reinforcement learning. You can take a look at the results. So there is AMD, Intel, NVIDIA, Huawei, Google TPUs, and with different frameworks, MXNet, TensorFlow, PyTorch. So in your spare time, take a look at this. 
And there are these smaller companies, startups, that as you said, are trying to come up with deep learning hardware or modern ways to do uh, hardware design for deep learning. Okay, any other questions?